This video is sponsored by Ground News. Vladimir Putin The answer to the question, what if Lex Luthor was real, but was thicker and didn't have a robot suit and was in charge of an antagonistic global superpower and was a totally cringeworthy, emotionally vapid coward that took topless pictures of himself fishing in Siberia? As far as being a totally corrupt warmonger goes, he's proven that he truly is the creme de la creme of the Kremlin gremlins. If you look at the polls from Russia, not that you can trust them, you understand, you'll see that Putin has been overwhelmingly supported by his citizens. If, however, you look at the polls from the polls in Poland, or the rest of the world for that matter, save a handful, you'll see that the consensus is that he's a narcissistic, bloodthirsty, nepotistic, corrupt, murderous fraud with a shit haircut and no mates. Today, we're going to take a look at Vladimir's history, how he came to power, and why he's about as impersonal and emotionless as a computer-generated parking ticket. Vladimir was born in October of 1952, making him a boomer, which explains a lot. He was born in Leningrad, a city that was still recovering from devastating Nazi sieges during World War II. Over a million people died during the siege, and the city still bore the scars of warfare. It was a time in which children starved as supply routes were cut off. Blizzards and pestilence ravaged the population, with people even resorting to cannibalism to survive. This is the context that Vladimir's childhood is steeped in, and as somebody who grew up in Pontypool, I can totally empathise. After studying law at Leningrad State University, Putin joined the KGB in 1975. It's thought that he was inspired to do so by his father, who had served in World War II and, after he had discharged, remained on the payroll of the state secret police as an informant. Putin spent his formative years in the KGB in Dresden, East Germany. According to Russian-American author Masha Gessen, he was basically just an unknown paper pusher. Picture a sort of David Brent, but without the humour or charm. Unsurprisingly, there's very little known about what he actually did, given that, you know, he was a spy and everything, but after watching the Berlin Wall come down, he resigned from active duty and returned to Leningrad in 1990. It was here that he rekindled his friendship with his former law professor, Anatoly Sobchak. When Putin returned to Russia, he found that the country was changing. The then-president, Mikhail Gorbachev, was doing some crazy anti-Soviet shit, like allowing democratic representation, unbanning books, and freeing imprisoned dissidents. One of the people to gain governmental office off the back of this whole crazy democracy thing was Putin's BFF, Anatoly Sobchak, who became the mayor of St. Petersburg. Putin then became his advisor, giving him his first taste of politics. Still with me? Good. Around 1991, the KGB were really fucked off at how President Gorbachev was trying to change Russia's image from being essentially the Mordor of planet Earth, so they staged a coup and placed Gorbachev under house arrest. During the actual coup, it's said that Putin and Sobchak demonstrated their strength and loyalty by hiding in a bunker underneath a factory until it was all over. Truly inspiring stuff. It's also widely believed by human rights activists and historians that Sobchak was playing both sides in order to ensure he came out on top. I'm playing both sides so that I always come out on top. After two days, the coup failed, and Vladimir didn't so much emerge victorious as much as he just kind of scurried out of his hiding place. You know, like a cockroach. Now we move to 1992. The Soviet Union has now been dissolved, and Mikhail Gorbachev has resigned. Boris Yeltsin is the first president of Russia, and Vladimir Putin finds himself in a spot of bother. He's now the head of the Committee for External Relations in St. Petersburg, and is being investigated for totally fucking up and or being a corrupt, horrible, useless bastard. See, Russia had a bit of a food shortage, and cash flow was tight, so... Putin oversaw a deal in which he bought food from a German company in exchange for around a hundred million dollars of raw materials. The deal was accepted, the materials were exported, but the food never arrived. 
While the original investigators found no evidence of Putin directly benefiting from the deal, the case was reopened in 1999 and Lieutenant Colonel Andrei Zikov found that money was being siphoned from St. Petersburg's city budget and into an indebted private construction company called 20th Trust. This directly implicated Putin in siphoning money out of the city and into his pocket. Now that Zikov had found irrefutable proof of corruption, Russia's Prosecutor General did exactly what you would expect and shut down the investigation on grounds of insufficient proof. This was in spite of the fact that money was being paid to a company that he helped set up while employed by the city, and that he was spending money far above what his salary at the time would allow. Now let's move to 1996. After Vlad's buddy Sobchak lost his bid for re-election in St. Petersburg, Putin resigned as his campaign manager and moved to Moscow to continue his political career. By 1997, President Boris Yeltsin appointed Putin as the Deputy Chief of Presidential Staff, which was a pretty big deal. I mean, look at how excited he is. After a series of promotions, Yeltsin appointed Putin as Prime Minister of Russia in 1999, which put him second to only the President himself. Now, let's stop for a second and take a look at this from their perspectives. You have Putin, a relatively unknown bureaucrat with a face that's set permanently to lobotomy mode, and whose approval rating was lower than a limbo bar at an Oompa Loompa birthday bash. Then you have the aging president, Boris Yeltsin, whose popularity was waning because he'd repeatedly defaulted on Russia's debts and was basically living in a perpetual state of drunkenness. If they wanted their happy ending, they were going to need to get Russians back on side and quickly. In September of 1999, four apartment buildings across Russia were bombed in the still of the night. Hundreds were killed, and over a thousand were injured in what is widely referred to as Russia's very own 9-11. Fear spread across the nation as Putin was quick to assign blame to Chechen terrorists. This gave him cause to trigger the Second Chechen War, and his perceived strength and aggression was received well by the shocked and grieving nation. Despite the widespread support, there were some that believed this to be a false flag attack by the Russian government in order to generate support for a war that was already decided upon. It really is like the jet fuel doesn't melt steel beams argument, except that, you know, there's actually evidence to show that this was definitely an inside job, and you don't need to be properly mental to believe it. Let me just familiarise you with a bit of the evidence. Two members of the FSB, basically the Russian secret police, were arrested after placing explosives in a building in Ryazan with a military detonator set to explode at 5.30 in the morning. The bomb was reported and diffused before exploding, but the FSB director Nikolai Patrushev claimed that the bags were not full of hexogen, but sugar. And despite stating that this was a real threat initially, he went on to claim that the whole thing was just a training exercise. In March of 2000, a private soldier in the Russian military was interviewed about the time he entered a military munition storage facility he was guarding to find bags of white powder labelled sugar. Curious, he cut a hole in one of the bags and took it away with him. After tasting the powder, he brought the bag to a platoon commander who identified the substance as hexogen. Third and not at all finally, Russian Duma speaker Gennady Selesnyov announced that he had received a report that an apartment building had been blown up in the city of Volgodonsk, a full three days before the blast actually happened. Truth is, these tactics were typical of the KGB and definitely bled through to the FSB as well. They paint a picture of just how many people Vladimir is willing to butcher for his own personal, political and financial gain. The Russian government demolished the buildings and destroyed evidence before a thorough investigation could take place. Putin's popularity skyrocketed after the attack and secured him the next presidential election. Yeltsin would hand Putin the presidency in return for immunity from prosecution and a number of financial assurances. 
By the end of the year 2000, Putin was officially the elected president of Russia, and all of the criminal investigations against himself were dropped. The slow decay of a democratic Russia had begun. Now, it's not just the Kremlin that looks to frame news stories in a way that is beneficial to their narrative, which is why I'm super excited to talk to you about today's sponsor, Ground News. Ground News is a service that lets you compare news articles between thousands of different sources in one single place. Take this story, for example. Vladimir Putin is set to meet with Russia's allies for the first time since the rebellion of the Wagner Group under Prigozhin. Ground News tells me who is reporting on this story and how they are politically aligned. In this case, it tells me that I would have likely missed this story being reported if I'd only read right-leaning media outlets. You can also compare headlines and access individual stories at the click of a button. It even scores the accuracy and potential bias of each article, which is an absolute game-changer. I can say that this is absolutely my favourite place to read up on current events, so go to ground.news forward slash geezer to get 30% off their Vantage subscription. The link is in the description. Thank you to Ground News for sponsoring the video and giving us access to truly transparent news coverage. Putin's first term as president was beset with problems he'd inherited from Yeltsin. The economy was in turmoil, and he despised Yeltsin's involvement with NATO, believing that it made Russia appear weak. It's clear now that Putin's ambition was to rebuild Russia in the image of the KGB, creating an insular and influential centralised government that could control everything. The first step to doing so was to take control of the media, and thus control what's being shown to the public. As state media outlets began to replace the independents that were crushed by the state police, Putin's power began to grow exponentially. This tactic of locking up and or murdering those that opposed him worked unsurprisingly well for Putin, as he meticulously worked his way through the country and destroyed those in opposition. In 2004, Vladimir was voted back in as president, receiving 71% of the definitely not rigged and absolutely not rigged votes. In 2008, Putin was barred from running for a third term thanks to the Russian constitution. This didn't stop him from being a sneaky, slimy little leech, though. Putin handed the presidency to his then Prime Minister, Dmitry Medvedev, and just one day later, Dmitry made Putin his Prime Minister. A lot of people speculated that this was a blatant act of power swapping, which it was, and Dmitry was nothing more than just a crusty, dirty little sock puppet for Putin's tiny and frail little lady hands. In 2011, Dmitry officially proposed that Putin should stand for presidency in 2012, and Putin humbly accepted. So, 2012 ticks over and he wins the presidency again with 64% of the very not rigged and definitely not rigged votes. This sparked riots and protests across the country, most notoriously from the feminist collective Pussy Riot. Their demonstrations saw them sent off to a penal colony on charges of hooliganism. See, Putin's history of being a shady, bloodthirsty incel with the emotional range of a boiled cabbage has really underpinned his illegitimate presidency. The truth is, he's really made it a public secret that anybody who mounts a true opposition to him will find themselves on the wrong end of the law or accidentally tripping and falling onto a bullet. Let's take a second to look at a few of the examples of people that ended up on the wrong side of the Kremlin. Garry Kasparov, the greatest chess player of all time, has been very active in his campaign against Putin's dictatorship. He even ran for presidency under the Other Russia Democratic Movement, and was one of those detained in the 2007 protests against Putin's election rigging. After being arrested and beaten by the police and having his access to media suppressed by the state, Kasparov was forced to flee Russia with his family in 2013. Anna Politkovskaya 
On the 7th of October 2006, Vladimir Putin's birthday, a journalist named Anna Politkovskaya was shot and killed in the lobby of her apartment building. Anna had a key role in exposing corruption within the Russian army and its conduct in Chechnya. Alexei Navalny a very popular figurehead in the campaign against Putin, Alexei regularly generated millions upon millions of views on his YouTube channel in which he advocated for people to vote out Putin's United Russia Party. During a flight to Moscow, he was poisoned using a substance called Novichok, a nerve agent developed by the Soviet Union. Come on, poisoned? Seriously? Alexander Litvinenko this guy was a former officer in the FSB and a prominent critic of the tiny little man we call Vladimir Putin. In 2006, he suddenly fell ill after totally accidentally eating polonium-210. Once again, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that Russia was responsible for his death because, holy fucking shit, obviously, the country was ordered to pay 100,000 euros in damages. Dan Rappaport Dan was an investor and a finance guy who was the co-owner of a Moscow nightclub called Soho Rooms. In 2017, his business partner and co-owner of Soho Rooms died by falling out of his apartment building's window. Then, on the evening of the 14th of August 2022, Rappaport was found dead in Washington DC after apparently falling from a nine-story high-rise. No explanation was given about the circumstances leading up to his death, but it certainly seems like calling Putin a money-hungry, cretinous prick makes you much more likely to fall out of a window to your death. Remember, this isn't a very exhaustive list. There are dozens upon dozens of examples of Putin's critics either being arrested and sent to penal colonies, or just outright being murdered. The War in Ukraine in February of 2022, Putin stated that he was carrying out a special military operation in Ukraine. Russian tanks began to roll into Ukraine on all fronts as Putin bombed cities and murdered thousands of civilians. You see, Putin has claimed for some time that Ukraine belongs to Russia and that they are all in fact one people. That sort of explains why he feels totally comfortable bombing them, but it ignores, you know, reality. The motivation behind this was clear. Putin had been feeling increasing paranoia towards NATO and its alliances. Even though the Cold War is now in the rearview mirror, NATO still continued to grow as countries like Hungary, Poland and the Czech Republic joined and bolstered their ability to protect themselves from being annexed once again. You can see, then, the motivation behind Putin's war in Ukraine. See, he's a subhuman lump of dog shit that once described the collapse of the Soviet Union as being the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Countries that were previously a part of the Soviet Union began to really enjoy their independence and flourishing cultures, and, as such, made the decision to join NATO to protect themselves against potential future aggressions. Ukraine was set to follow in their neighbours' footsteps, but when time came to actually officially sign as a NATO member, the then-president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, pulled out in favour of a stronger relationship with Russia. Hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians took to the streets to protest, and over a hundred people were killed as the president cracked down on the protesters. The Ukrainian people gave a taste of their resolve and continued to protest until Viktor was forced out of office and fled the country. He fled, naturally, to Russia. In 2019, the now famous Vladimir Zelensky was elected as president of Ukraine, and Russia began to realise that its control over the country was slipping. Putin began preparing to invade Ukraine in February of 2021 by deploying troops to the border under the ruse of a large-scale exercise. In December of 2021, Putin demanded that NATO troops move away from Russia's borders, back to where they were before the Cold War. After NATO refused, Putin responded by invading Ukraine on the 24th of February 2022. It's now July 2023. 
the Russian military continues to advance through Ukraine. It's clear that Vladimir didn't expect to meet such strong resistance from the Ukrainian people, but their resolve under this invasion has inspired millions across the world to support their cause. Over 17 million people have been displaced. Over 60,000 people have died, and over 400 billion US dollars in damages has been incurred. Putin continues to insist that he's bombing cities and murdering civilians in order to liberate them from the Nazi government controlled by the West. We're at a point in which Putin has been in power for over 23 years. He's created a culture in which nobody will meaningfully oppose him for fear of being imprisoned or murdered. While it's impossible to get a truly unbiased understanding of how Russians feel about the Ukraine invasion, there have been scores of protests in several cities across the country. The pressure from the economic sanctions being imposed by the rest of the world will also be putting significant pressure on Putin's ability to present himself as the economically responsible candidate he always has done. The way I see it, it's just a matter of time before Putin's dictatorship is ended once and for all. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, it really helps the channel. A special shout out to the Bacardi Breezer, Fridge Freezer, Lemon Squeezer geezers that support me on Patreon. Marie, Alex Davies, Alexis Geds, Ash, Craig Hall, Dan Sharp, Fluffy the Demon, Destroyer of Worlds, Nice, Jeffrey Anderson, Logan Zureshk, Lord Kitty Cat, Matthew Gray, Nicholas Ellis Brown, Rory McElhone, and Simon Watton. You guys are all fucking awesome. If you'd like to support, you can do so from just £1 a month. The link is in the description. Love you. Bye bye.